He said he never went out looking for cocaine, he went out looking for a drink and a good time. But when he was drunk, he took cocaine. And the, and the fascinating thing about it is, he's out there drinking bottles of Bollinger three or four at a time, 100 pounds, and then going out to a nightclub, drinking more, and then he takes cocaine. I spent all this money getting myself drunk, and then I took this stuff and it sobered me up. Um, which is a <laughs> bit ironic, really. He used to do two, three grams a night on a night out. Probably every half an hour or so. And he, you know, we'd go to clubs and he'd end up in going off into the toilet with some guy who says he was a West Ham supporter and I've got some coke for you because I support West Ham. And he'd just go off with them into the toilet. He'd got so sort of into it that he just was oblivious to everything. I know of other footballers that, that took it, yeah. Not, not as heavily as Frank, but that did take it, yeah. Top level players. And there he was in this big West End nightclub, and he looked across in the corner, and he never told me who this particular player was. He said, but there was a household name footballer, an England international of that time, sitting in the corner with his head in his hands, crying his heart out because he was high on drugs and drunk out of his skull. Although in my dealings with him, he has said that he is, you know, ashamed and sorry for what he did, but you've had to kind of almost prize that out of him reluctantly because I don't think he really regrets it at all. Whether Frank did more than just snort coke is another matter. His football career was in decline. West Ham wanted to offload him, and despite his high wages, Frank and Jenny were in debt. He started carrying this attaché case around with him everywhere, as if he was some sort of, you know, business magnate or something. And uh, I had a look in it one day, and it was full of wraps of cocaine. Mr. One said, I had drugs in my briefcase and my attache case and my, my desk. You know, I never had a desk in my life. You know, I certainly never carried a briefcase. You know, it's... <laughs> so it, it sounded good, you know, a attache case. And all that. I, didn't, I had to find out what an attache case was. The final break with West Ham came in early 1992. Whatever he was doing off the field, on it, he still knew that football was his greatest stage. We all knew it was his last game. The manager, who I think, as usual with Frank, he'd fallen out with, didn't want to play him at all. Frank came on and, being Frank, you know, you know, gave us all a treat by scoring a hat-trick. And the place was, went absolutely ballistic. And then he was gone. Frank headed home, back to his roots, joining his old West Ham teammate Liam Brady, now manager at Celtic. It was the last throw of the dice. He very quickly took up with his old pals in the East End of Glasgow, and uh, just like he was in the East End of London. He was uh, living life to the full, as they say, and uh, you know the consequences were that I could only see it was short term. Brady was right. Frank lasted 18 unsuccessful months at Celtic. His career petered out, and so, acrimoniously, did his relationship with Jenny Blythe. But there was a sting in the tail. The tabloids were turning against him. They had been investigating stories of footballers and drugs, identifying the Arsenal and England star Paul Merson, but they knew there were more to come. She talked to people in the game, and they suddenly said, drugs in football, of course there is. So it didn't take a lot, a lot of time to find out that quite a few names were involved, and one of the names that came up quite frequently was Frank McAvennis. Piers Morgan for me at 10 at 10 on a Friday night. He says, we've got you. Says, you got me. He says, uh, we've got Jenny, she's doing a story on you, blah, blah, blah. And... Piers Morgan, the editor, actually contacted me, and he asked me to do a story, and I said no, and he came back a few times, and um, he offered me about £20,000 in the end. You know, basically, I'd have to make up my mind if, if I wanted to do it and stop that story again. And yeah, it was hard because, you know, first I thought it, it was not right that she was going to make money on doing something like this. 
And so I rang his agent to say, look, I'm not doing the story, don't believe them. I'm not, I've, not, I've said I'm not going to do it. And he, he, so he did know that I wasn't doing it. And he went ahead and did it. I asked for a hundred grand that they offered me two weeks earlier, but they never gave me it. <laughs> but, uh, but at least it stopped her getting money out of me. Um, and that was the last time I played football. So it basically stopped, that finished my career. Drugs and the tabloid press had killed Frank's football career. The question now was whether they would take over the rest of his life. He's here, look out, look at the girl. I'd say, look Frank, where are you gonna get your money for to live this lifestyle that you like so much? He just wouldn't listen, he smiled and he said, oh, I'll be all right. And, you know, I've got a plan, I've got a scheme, I've got this, I've got a deal, I've got this, you know. And sadly, so he did. Frank McAvenny's plan surfaced in 1995, just after he finished football. A Land Rover Discovery was stopped by police at Dover Docks en route for Holland. The police were looking for a car smuggling ring. Instead, they found £200,000 in cash in a box in the back seat. <laughs> They called the customs in uh, because we have powers under the Drugs Trafficking and Offences Act to actually detain the money in the first instance. And that's what we did. They didn't have a clue it was my money until I, I, I phoned up and said, it's mine. A hundred grand of us. You know, I want money back. Frank's explanation was not what the customs officers expected. He claimed the cash was en route to Holland to finance a treasure hunt. It was for a diving expedition on a vessel called the Braganza, which was a 19th century boat believed to have treasure on board and had sunk in the North Sea. I had uh, just this vision of Frank sailing across the channel with Blackbeard the pirate and this big mast with a skull and crossbones on it looking for a treasure chest. <laughs> it was laughable. The story was laughable. And you think, well, it's that laughable. Maybe Frank could be... It could be genuine here. There was a, a shipwreck somewhere, I just say, whatever. I was buying a vessel. That's what my money was going to, which was collateral. 18 months later, Frank appeared in court. Unfortunately for him, it came days after another court had fined him for possession of cocaine. When police found the paper fold with the cocaine in McIverney's jeans, he said, it's just a little bit of Charlie. The burden of proof here is a civil case and it has to be balance of probability that it was either proceeds of drug dealing or intended for use. He had the, the opportunity in open court to say how he came uh, by the money and what he intended to do with it. I would have stood up in court and say, here, it's my money if it was going for drugs. There's no way you know, I would have done that. I would have put my family through that. I don't think he was very pleased that uh, the magistrates ruled in our favour.